All right, um, we are going to look again at um, reflecting on the second commandment. So if you've got your book, this is page 40. If you don't have a book, you don't really need it anyway. Uh, you don't have to have it. Um, we are kind of doing an in-depth study uh, of the small catechism, uh, looking in, in quite detail uh, at, right now, each commandment. We're on the second commandment. Um, you'll see this list of questions here that are just meant to help us reflect on what uh, the keeping of the second commandment actually entails. Okay? Um, you know, a minute ago I was just talking about how you know, the Lutherans did not give up the practice of private confession and absolution. In fact, they go out of their way to keep it. Uh, if you read uh, kind of the, the um, writings of the time, especially some which are contained in the Book of Concord, like the Augsburg Confession, I mean, they explicitly say the practice of private confession and absolution is retained in our churches. Um, it is something that has fallen out of use, uh, unfortunately. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that. But it is something that God's people, you know, want to, to be able to avail themselves of if they feel the need to. Again, something like private confession absolution, it's not a law. It's not something we have to do. Um, but it is something that is there for us when such times arise where we need to be um, particularly comforted with the gospel. So... Um, I would encourage you all to be aware of that. And here's what you do. We're going to actually talk about how you do confession absolution because I think a lot of times we're like, what exactly does the pastor do in there, you know? Um, there is a small rite for it in the hymnal, okay, which is uh, generally what we use. Um, but this is how you prepare for it. Because a lot of times we're like, well, I don't really have sins that need to be confessed, okay? As though that's true. Um, but, you know, when we reflect on the Ten Commandments and what they actually mean for us, it becomes pretty obvious, you know, the fact that we don't feel that we have sins that we really need to confess is probably itself a sin. <laughs> because, well, we must think we're doing pretty good. Um, but again, it is meant for things that burden our conscience. <coughs> so, <clears throat> uh, this is again page 40. Let's see, where, where did we end off? Does anybody remember which question we ended with? It was, I think it was the third one. Do I stand up and swear by God's name when it is for the truth of the gospel or the benefit of my neighbor in need? Um, what this is saying is, look, do we keep God's name holy in our daily conversation, especially when we have the opportunity to bear witness to the truth of the gospel? Or do we just kind of go about our business and pretend that it's not our responsibility to speak the truth in love. And it's getting hard sometimes to speak the truth in love because the world we're living in has never liked God's church and it really doesn't like God's church now. Uh, and there are times in life, you know, where we run into people, uh, maybe at work or you know, who knows, maybe out on the kid's soccer field or something like that. And, you know, inevitably, this kind of stuff will come up from time to time. Um, and if we are going to keep God's name holy, well, that actually means that we got to do it. Uh, and that means we need to be willing to teach the truth when the opportunity arises. Yeah, how many of you have ever had that experience where you run into someone, well, I, we all believe in the same God. You know, we just... We just kind of get to them by different ways. Hmm. Let me think about that for a minute. No. That is not what we believe. Okay? Um, you know, and sometimes it's hard because it's like, okay, <coughs> what are we going to say to this person? Have we thought about how we're going to address this issue? Um, it is good to think about these things. It is good to talk about these things so that when it comes up, you've already thought about it. Okay, um, it's good to practice. So let me ask you, if somebody actually came up to you and said, and this is probably happening in your own life, well, we all just believe in the same God, what might you say? Well, 
Okay, so ask them who their God is. How do you call upon your God? What does your God say about himself? What does your God ask you to do? Uh, Mark, what were you going to say? Same thing. Okay. Yeah, which God? Okay. Um, these are good questions to ask. As though our God is the same God who bids, you know, people in this world to go around murdering other people, okay? Or to find comfort in our works instead of comfort in the blood of Jesus. Um, it is a superficial question in a way, or a superficial statement, right? Well, we all just believe in, in the same God. I mean, what does that really tell you? These people obviously have not thought about this a lot. But it's really, really common because, you know, we're not in a situation anymore where we talk openly about uh, Christ, about God. You know, there's this kind of fear and anxiety related to this, and there's kind of a whole cultural movement behind that. But it is our responsibility to bear witness to the truth. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, that is a really key point, all right, especially when we're dealing with our brothers and sisters of Christ who belong to other confessions of faith. Um, you know, oftentimes people say, well, we have the Bible in our church, and we have the Bible in our church, and therefore, you know, we're kind of all the same. I mean, you hear this, this actually is kind of a similar argument, um, where, you know, you'll hear other Christians say stuff like, well, you know, we can all just get along. We don't want to let our differences divide us and this sort of stuff. Um, but simply because you have the Bible doesn't mean you're going to agree on it. And if we understand that God is communicating to himself those things which he wants to know for our salvation, that's a really big deal. I mean, a really big deal. This isn't like small stuff. I mean, either Christ is present in the sacrament or he's not. And if he is, what a comfort for us. If he's not, well, um, that kind of tells us something. So again, um, we always want to speak in love. We always want uh, to do the best that we can with the help of God to speak the truth. And I think we will have more opportunity to do this in the future. But this is a part of keeping God's name holy. All right, now, I like this one. Yes. Right, yeah, do and done. There are only two religions, okay? The religion of the gospel, which is the, the work of God for you, or the religion of the law, which is ultimately your work for God. Yeah, there's, and I mean, it's, in a way, that, that's exactly how it is, okay? It comes down to those two points, which is something we want to emphasize, right? Both for those who are in the church um, and may not understand the gospel in the same way that we do, but especially for those outside of it. As I mentioned last week, you know, a lot of times when you're dealing with unbelievers, um, they look at you and they look at other people in the world, and sometimes it's hard for them to tell the difference. You go to work, you have your family, you try to take care of yourself more or less. You know, you look just like everybody else, and so they're like, we must be the same. Because they're only judging the outward works. Whereas for us as Christians, we ought to see the situation from a completely different perspective. What we do in life um, is not going to determine if we get into heaven or not. What determines whether we get into heaven or not is what Christ has done for us. And the work that we do isn't holy simply because we do it. It's holy because we are declared to be God's people who are righteous in Christ. That makes whatever work we do holy in the sight of God. But the work in and of itself may be no different than what your unbelieving coworker does. But from God's perspective, he sees the situation very differently. Okay? This also ought to help us in our daily vocations to see 
that whatever calling God has given us is a holy calling for us. Because it is always done as the baptized child. All right, now, going on. Do I pray with fervor in times of trouble? Or do we fall into despair? Do we call upon God in the hour of need, recognizing that ultimately, however we may be delivered from a situation that confronts us, it is only by His grace and His mercy that He will be. Which also tells us what about suffering for us. <sighs> yeah, it's actually good for us. I told y'all, uh, I think last week or the week before, about that letter that the first president of the Missouri Synod wrote to that pastor who was out in the Midwest, you know, and his whole family had died, and it was just him. He lost all his kids, his wife. And Walther writes back, and he goes, you must be really blessed by God. Because he's taken everything that you could hope and trust in from you. Now, that is really hard for us sinners to come to terms with. Because the old Adam in us just cannot stand suffering in the body. But suffering actually drives us to the cross. And it reminds us about our own mortality and the situation that ultimately confronts us. And that is a good thing for us. Um, so, do we pray in these times? Now, I said I was going to assign some homework for you, okay? And you are going to have to remember the way to pray that I taught you last week. Is there anybody who remembers? <laughs> oh, oh, okay, X. Okay, now we have someone in the front row. Okay, I like to pick on the front row. Can you tell us what the acronym stands for? You can do it. I tried it with the kids, even. It's great. It's now that the pressure is on, the school teacher has all the pressure. <laughs> Adoration. Adoration. Yeah, the adoration. Okay, stating something about God, right? Then you have what? C. Confession. Okay, stating our problem in sin. Then what is the T? Yeah, thanksgiving for what Christ has done and how he has answered that problem of sin. And then what's the S? The supplication. What we are going to ask God for his help in respect to. Um, suffering causes us to, to recognize that we, we need the Lord. We need his grace. We need his mercy, mercy both of body and of soul. Um, this is actually what we are praying for in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, now, am I bored and indifferent in prayer? Which basically means, are we praying? Not only in the hour of need, but also in relation to thanksgiving, daily thanksgiving for the gifts that God has given us. Or does it seem like a frivolous matter? If we are not praying, we are not hallowing God's name. And think about this. This is the second commandment. This is talking about the way that God relates to us and the way that we relate to him. Do we even care? Go ahead, Jim. I know. Yeah, our, you know, our minds like to wander away from the things that God would have us really pay attention to. There's nothing more important for us than the Word of God. And the fact that Jesus has actually taught us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer is, is I mean, think about it. God has actually given us the words to pray. And would that we would not only pray them, but that we would reflect on them. Um, the, what is so great about this point is that we recognize even when we are trying to do these things, we are still sinning because we are not always reflecting on what's going on. Sometimes we just go through the motions. Um, all of this, of course, it is sin. And it is us not keeping the second commandment. And in the eyes of God, it is a grave sin. I mean, it's a sin that's worthy of damnation like every other sin. And we do it all the time and we kind of get used to it. And we think, oh, it's not really that bad. 
Nobody else is really praying all that much. They're probably thinking about Wendy's too. <laughs> you know? All right, so we ought not to be bored and indifferent with prayer, both here at church and in our daily lives. And if we are, it is a sin that needs to be confessed and one which we need uh, to receive forgiveness of. Now, here's a question. If this was something that you were going to pray about and to confess, um, what would be the thanksgiving? How would you answer the problem of sin in relation to our not praying? Okay, thank you that our sins are forgiven. But where specifically in the gospel, where does Jesus do this for us? Where does he answer this problem? Yeah, I'm lying with you always. But he prays. Jesus always prays. He never had a moment where he did not keep God's name holy. It is why the Bible records for us that he prays frequently. There are times when he will even take the rest, but he doesn't go watch a football game, okay? He prays. Our Lord has kept this commandment where we have not. You see how beautiful the Acts prayer is? Because it recalls for us how the Lord has kept the law where we have not. And does it look from God's perspective as Christians as though we have kept it? In Christ, it does even though we know that according to our old sinful nature, we haven't. So thank goodness that Christ has come to pray to God for us and in our place. And is he still praying for us? Yes, he is. And we can give thanks to the Lord that our Lord is still praying on our behalf. Okay. Is it true that I cannot speak about God rightly because I am bored with God's word and neglect the study of the catechism and doctrine? Can you speak rightly about God? We hope so. If you can't, that's why we're here. Okay? And we always need to be here, always studying the word of God because we are never done learning it. And if you find yourself sometimes unable to answer people's questions about the Bible, it tells you you need to study more. And you know what the good thing is? You will never be able to answer everybody's questions about the Bible. So you will always need to study it. And we should rejoice in this fact that God, first off, has preserved his word among us. Because if God wanted to, he could take it from us. And he has done that to other peoples. And that, that is a great judgment of the Lord over the sinful mankind. In fact, I would argue that is, that is the greatest judgment here in time, that God should take his word from us. So we should rejoice in it, and we should study it, and we shouldn't be bored with it. I mean, you know, it's kind of weird. You know, sometimes we read the Bible. My own kids, my own kids tell me this. You know, they're like, Dad, I already know that story. You know? Well, I'm glad you know the story. Can you really tell me what it means? Can you apply it to your life? Where are you in this story? Where is Jesus for you in this story? How are you going to share this with somebody else? And then they're kind of like, Dad, you're taking this really serious. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, it's a very serious thing. Right. Yeah, the comment was, you know, that, of course, we're supporting this church up in Siberia. One of these days, I'm going to get back to you guys and talk to you about that because there's a lot of great things going on there. But when that church was kind of overrun by the Stalinists and whatnot, you know, the Bible for a long time had passed away from them. And um, they had to rely, as the persecuted churches many times, on what they had memorized and what they knew. Now, thankfully, the, the catechism is something that I think we still know. And we, at the very least, know that it's really important because the catechism is the word of God in its most essential parts. Um, and we always want to have it with us, but it's why we should have the word of God in our hearts and on our minds. We need to be memorizing it. The Bible doesn't say meditate on the word of God day and night, you know, as like a suggestion. 
Okay, it, it intends for us to do that because we are sinners after all, and we need it with us. We need it in times of joy, and we need it in times of sorrow. We need it when we're awake, and we need it when we're tired. We need it at all times in our life. And for us to think that we don't, that is nothing but the old Adam. Because the Word of God is meant to be with us at all times in our lives. And we should keep God's name holy by using it. All right. Is my heart and life in the praise of God in worship? Am I mouthing things while my heart is far away? Are you here and are you paying attention? You know, Luther comments in numerous places that he was really frustrated with people who would just go to church out of habit. And they would show up, and they would not learn anything, and then they would leave that year, having gone to church for a whole year, and they would know nothing more than when they had started. If you do not hear the Word of God with ears that are actually listening, you are rejecting the Word of God. And our old Adam will do this. That's like when we come to church and we're thinking about all the other stuff we're going to do afterward, okay, in the midst of worship. Or if we have not taken the time to be rested before we gather together so that we're not tired. Because if you're tired, it's hard to pay attention. And I know life is busy. Believe me, I know life is busy, okay. Um, but what's more important than the Word of God? Because the word of God is Christ coming to us. We should prepare for worship. You should get here early and not like 10 minutes late. <laughs> I know sometimes it's hard. And the Ten Commandments is a lot of law. Okay, this, this section is a lot of law. Um, but meditate on the word of God. Prepare for what God is about to give you um, so that your heart and your mind are focusing on, the, on the, the things of God instead of the things of men. Let the world be put away from you when you gather together in this place. The, yeah, in the front of the hymnal, you know, there's, there's prayers for the beginning of worship and the close of worship and the Lord's Supper, and these are all good things. Don't drag the world into the church with you. Because that's what the devil wants, right? Go ahead, Byron. Right. Yeah, you know, and, and it happens in our churches too, where, you know, there is this kind of just, you know, the commotion of life comes into the church. Um, don't you just want to be at rest? Don't you feel that way, like your life is on nonstop fast forward? You know, it's like you're watching a movie and you're going, blah, 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 you know, and they're like running on fast forward, you know, on the old VHS. Um, church is God's time for us to rest. That's why it is the Sabbath. Um, but if we don't prepare ourselves, a lot of times it may not feel that way. So again, we want to keep God's name holy by gathering together uh, in a way where we are hearing about what God has done for us. Oh, yes. That's right. Be fed on the Wednesday evening service. Okay? And there are great penitential seasons as well. I mean, that's such a helpful thing for us. All right. Um, in my life, is my life sealed with the name of God in baptism, characterized by thanksgiving and praise? I once heard a pastor preach a sermon on how negativity is a sin. You know, I think back to that sermon a lot. Because I think he's right. Negativity is a sin. Because what are we doing when we're like obsessed with negative stuff? <laughs> yeah, we're not thankful for what God has done. And what God's promises are for us in the present. And we always want something more. 
<clears throat> and who doesn't do that, right? Um, the baptized life is quite different in its character and its form because the baptized life is one that's where the old Adam has been crucified. That is, the old Adam who is not thankful, the old Adam who is jealous, the old Adam who doesn't stop. Um, you know, when Luther talks about reflecting and, and living a baptized life, this is what he means. This is who you are when you get up in the morning. You are God's child. And if you are God's child, that means you belong to God's family. And God is going to take care of you. And he loves you if he sends you suffering, even though it doesn't feel it. But he does it so that you may call upon him. He does it so that you may be comforted in his promises. He does it so that you won't forget him. Because we love to forget God with all the other things that absorb our thoughts and our time and our energy. The Sabbath uh, is given to us. I know we're not on the third commandment yet, okay, but, but keeping God's name holy is a part of this. So again, we want to not only thank and praise God as we gather together on Sunday morning, but really that ought to shape our lives for the rest of the week. This is who we are. Okay, let's look at these Bible verses here. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, this ungrateful, unthankful. Um, he does. <clears throat> now, that does not mean, you know, that God says we are going to be happy and um, healthy and wealthy and, you know, all these, these things that we then think are the opposite of the negativity. That's not what he's saying. That's not how Christ lived. I mean, Christ lived in the midst of a lot of suffering. But it is a life that is lived in the midst of suffering with hope and with joy in the gospel. That is our life. And that is what God is doing to us. He is actually giving us this, this cruciform life, the end of which is eternal life. So when he lays crosses on you, you ought to be thankful even though I know how hard that is to do. And it's just, it's so hard to do, which is why we actually need one another, and we need to pray for each other. He does, right? I mean, think about what would happen if you parents never disciplined your children. Really, what would happen to your kids? They would turn into monsters. Because the old, and I'm serious, I, I am not kidding. Because the old Adam will become completely absorbed with the self to the most cruelest extent possible. You must do it because you love your children. Yeah, in a way that I would say that, that there is some truth to that, right? Uh, because you are really casting them into... Vice. I mean, just pure vice. Um, of course, we were all children once, and we didn't like it when we were disciplined, did we? No. Because the old Adam doesn't want to be corrected, and the old Adam does not want to submit to those whom God has put over us um, for our care. It's the same way with us. Do we give God thanks and praise? Do we find comfort in his works for us? Do we recognize this in the midst of our daily life? This is all a part of the second commandment. That's how we keep God's name holy. All right, let's look at Leviticus 19.12. <coughs> it says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Um, one of the things you will constantly hear is, um, like in popular media and stuff, they'll bring up all this stuff from Leviticus, okay? Because there are three laws that are given in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The first is the moral law, okay? Which is woven into creation itself. This is the stuff of the Ten Commandments. It is binding on everyone forever because it is a part of our creatureliness. 
You have the civil laws, which are given to God's people, Israel, for a period of time by which they will outwardly govern themselves as they are surrounded by unbelieving nations. This will be fulfilled when Christ the King comes. You also have the ceremonial laws. This is the stuff of the sacrifices, which is all talking about how God atones for the sin of his people, and it looks forward to the coming of Christ, which is fulfilled in Christ as the Lamb of God. We are no longer bound to the ceremonial and the civil law because we know that those have been fulfilled in Jesus. However, they are useful for us to study. And they are useful because they show the patterns in the, in the, the they show the patterns by which God has acted for his people, especially how serious he treats the love of the neighbor and the judgment of sin, and also its forgiveness by the blood sacrifice. You will notice in this book that they will, especially in the Ten Commandments, bring up other things in Leviticus. And on the one hand, we're not bound to those things in Leviticus, but they are useful for learning, especially where they coincide with keeping the law for the well-being of our neighbor. Um, here it's talking about not swearing by God's name um, falsely. What this means is that we are not to use God's name um, and thereby deceive others when it is used. So you should not invoke God's name and then say something that is false. Now that seems self-evident. But God really does not like this. And the reason God doesn't like it is because when you invoke God's name, you invoke his character. And if you turn around and lie, what are you saying about God? You are saying God is a liar. By your actions, that is what you are communicating. And if God is a liar, can we have confidence in our salvation? No, we cannot. We must use God's name very carefully in this respect because God is faithful and God is trustworthy and God doesn't lie. Look at the next one here in Numbers 32. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Again, what this is saying is that we must do what we have said because we are God's people. And if we don't do what we have said, we are bringing shame on God's name. And we are bringing God's name into disrepute. Um, God really doesn't like that. Nor should he. Because God is faithful. And when we invoke God's name and then say something, testifying or swearing or whatever, um, you know, we ought to realize we have to speak just as clearly as God has spoken. Hebrews 6.16, it says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Um, what this means is the writer of the Hebrews here is basically saying, you know, in the church, um, we are God's people and we invoke God's name because we are Christians and we go by God's name. And when we speak and we invoke the name of God, it should be the end of every dispute because we ought to say things as they are. And if we invoke God's name, we ought not to lie, and we should be completely honest. This is a great sin in the church today, especially in the broader church when it comes to doctrine and teaching. Um, there is this gentleman in the Missouri Synod right now. His name is Matthew Becker. Have you guys heard of this gentleman? Okay, a few of you. This is important. You need to be aware of these things. He is a professor at Valparaiso University. And um, he is publicly teaching all kinds of false doctrine. And when I mean all kinds of false doctrine, I mean like every false doctrine. He's rejecting the inerrancy of scripture. He is advocating 
um, gay marriage, the women's ordination, open communion, all this sort of stuff. Um, Yeah, he went to this ordination of a non-Missouri Synod pastor who's not going to be teaching the truth and was vested. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we must speak the truth if we call ourselves by God's name. This person knows they are not teaching the truth as we are confessing it. And yet they are persisting in teaching something that is false. Um, the same thing could happen to us. The right course of action, then, is to simply be honest and to say, I am not teaching what this church body is confessing. And what should we then do? Yeah, we should then actually leave because um, we ought not to wreck that whole house. Okay, We ought to gather together with those who are saying the same thing as we are. Far be it from us to lie and deceive and willfully try to destroy God's church. Um, but think about how often this happens just in daily life. Where, you know, I love the examples of husbands and wives, okay? Because, you know, um, you may, uh, you, know, you know the Valentine's thing is coming up, right? Okay, and all the husbands were bid to take their wives to the Valentine's thing. Um, you should do that. That shows your wife you care. Um, but if you forget, <coughs> you know, you may just, well, let's just say you don't take your wife. This is just an example. I'm not saying this is going to happen. <coughs> okay. Let's just say you don't take her. And you know you should, but maybe you want to use the excuse you forgot. Could you try and deceive her by telling her that you just forgot and really insisting that you just forgot? Yeah, you could. Um, this is very much like uh, the way we are to keep the second commandment. Because you can deceive others so that they may not know the truth. Your wife might end up thinking you really didn't know about it. You really forgot. But we are to call a thing as it is. We are to confess the truth. It would be better, you know, to be honest and to confess one's sin uh, than to lie. Go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> here's the deal. Okay, Valparaiso um, is a Lutheran school. I have to be very. Have we have any Valpo grads here? Oh, we have one. All right. Um, <clears throat> It is, which is why, uh, again, we all want to teach and we want to confess the same confession so that um, we are speaking the word of truth together. This idea that we all just have the same God and the same teaching and we all just need to get along even if we're not saying the same thing it is not true. That's actually a lie. Unity only comes from the word of truth. And it only comes from being honest about what we are confessing about the word of truth. This sort of stuff just needs to be dealt with. And we need to be honest about it. Because if we lie to ourselves and say, well, it's no big deal, what's going to happen? All this false teaching will spread. And this is nothing new. Every age has false teaching. But um, would that we should... Study the Word of God together to see what the Word of God actually says about itself. You know, if I were to err in some teaching, which could very well happen someday, would that um, other pastors would correct me? Because what do I want to do? Well, as a pastor, I want to teach the truth. But I'm a sinful human being, and you're a sinful human being. And we can confess things that are wrong. Go ahead. What is that? Sorry, I couldn't hear it. Okay. Uh, well, this is kind of interesting. 
I really was not intending to talk about this today, but I'm going to, because it's important, okay? We don't want to get all kind of worked up about this stuff. Um, but it is our responsibility as Christians, especially to be praying about it. What happened was um, some pastors had gone to this person and had tried to confront him and essentially were like, look, you know, you're teaching stuff that's really bad, that's just not scriptural. I mean, these aren't issues. This is not hard stuff. Um, he teaches evolution. He teaches women's ordination. He teaches gay marriage. teaches that the... I mean, what is this stuff? What is this course? Uh, he's a biologist, I think. Is that correct? He teaches theology. He teaches theology, yeah. I, uh, I've only peripherally, yeah, there we go. Okay, we should have great confidence in this guy. Um, but, but actually, I, I shouldn't be laughing about it because it's, it's a serious thing, okay? It's a serious matter. Um, anyway, uh, some pastors confronted him, and he, he didn't want to change his teaching, okay? So there was this process that was created a few years ago that changed the process we had before. The process before we had was better. But basically, it, it, he got brought up on charges, Okay, which you really don't want to have to do unless somebody is really unrepentant. Uh, and, and great lengths have gone to try and correct this. I mean, think about if it was you, right? I mean, you would want someone to work with you for a very long time before you kind of have to bring it before the church. I mean, that's, that's kind of a traumatic thing. But eventually, the false teaching has to be dealt with. It must be dealt with. Um, so it goes before this, this dispute resolution panel, okay? Um, before, and this was before I was even born, we used to have um, some kind of judicial process in the Missouri Synod where there was a governing body that you would go before, kind of like Luther did, and you would have to defend your own teaching from the Word of God. Um, and if you were found to be in error and you were repentant, then you were asked to leave for a church body that was in keeping with the teaching that you were holding, which is a good process, to be honest, as long as those on the governing body are faithful, <clears throat> okay? <coughs> now it goes to this thing called the dispute resolution panel, which is made up, do, Sandra, do you know who's on the dispute resolution panel? I don't either. It's a, it's a mixed body, I think, of, of people who are on it. Anyway, um, basically what happened was the dispute resolution panel said they didn't want to deal with it. So they took like this sort of in absentia vote or whatever. We're like, we're just not going to deal with this. So then it goes to the district president. If I'm not mistaken, please understand, I, I don't spend all my time reading all this stuff. I should spend more of my time since this is a big issue. And the, the district president of that particular district said he didn't want to deal with it. So uh, thankfully, the president of our Senate came out and did the right thing and said, this is a terrible mistake, that, that essentially we're not being faithful um, by dealing with false teaching. And what's interesting, you know, when you think about this, if a pastor commits some big moral sin, what happens to him? Whew, he's kicked out, okay? Which he should resign uh, and, and hopefully repent. Uh, and, then, and then again, I hear the word of God and, and continue on in the church, not as a pastor, uh, but certainly as one of the people. I mean, that's really what we want in those situations. But we'll, you know, we'll, we'll remove him from office, okay? But think about this. When it comes to all this false teaching, all of a sudden we don't want to do anything. Um, that's not keeping God's name holy because we're not taking the word of God serious. <clears throat> Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. And we should pray all the time for this sort of stuff. Again, th this gets back to us keeping God's name holy. Um, and I would say it, it is important in every age, but especially in our age. Because as the world begins to attack the true teachings of the church, we in the church don't want to be having arguments amongst ourselves about what constitutes the truth. This is a big, a big thing. Okay. Uh, let's keep going here. The last one, Matthew 5, 37. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. I mean, think about that for a minute. Jesus is saying, you know, simply state the truth. Tell it how it is. Um, and, you know, it's really funny because, like, with little kids, and maybe with teenagers too, I don't know. I don't have any of those yet. Um, 
they, they're kind of blunt, right? They'll just sort of be mean, you know? Or they'll take the lightsaber and whack somebody over the head with it, you know, if things aren't going the way they think they should be. <clears throat> What's interesting is the older we get, the more crafty we become. Yeah, because we, we learn how to deceive other people with our words. I don't have to beat somebody up with a lightsaber, right? I can, I can get at them in other ways. Yeah, I forgot, you know, or I'll go to mom and dad first and tell the story the way I want to, right? Um, <clears throat> Jesus is saying all of that is sin. We simply need to be honest. But that's difficult, isn't it? Especially when we've done something wrong. Because then what do we have to admit? I'm the guilty one. I'm the one who sinned. Um, in a way, it's actually very liberating as well. Because once we are able to just say it how it is, and we understand that when there is confession of the truth, well, then there's also forgiveness. I mean, this gentleman who's teaching all this false teaching, if he, if he just wrote, he could do one of two things. He could leave peaceably, and we would just let him go. I mean, we don't, you know, if he wants to teach those things, well, go off where you can teach those things, okay? Um, we're not going to hound him forever. I mean, you know, he's, he's going to teach what he thinks is the truth, and we're going to teach what the Word of God says. Um, what was the other part? Of this? Oh, but if he repents, okay, and then teaches the truth, well, then we must forgive him, and we must let it go. I mean, that's actually how it works. That's the way it is in our lives as well, <clears throat> which is why we need to do this more. And we need to pray with God's help that we will be able to speak the truth and speak it without fear, without fear of reprisal, without fear uh, of being judged without the forgiveness of sins. Um, we should be practicing this in our daily lives with one another, especially those who are Christian. It's always a little bit trickier, you know, when you're dealing with people who are not Christian, who don't know how to forgive, you know. But I would say we, haven't, we don't practice this well. We need to be doing this more in our own lives. And there's more than enough opportunity to do this. <coughs> okay. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, using the Lord's name in vain. <sighs> yeah, using it in a frivolous or ungodly way, without reverence. Um, it was really funny. I don't know if I got any of the college kids in here. I think I might. They were over one time. I feel, now I gotta feel like i got to be all quiet. They were over one time at our place. Shut my mic off because they probably listen to me out there. They were over at our, uh, our house for a care slave at one time, and we were, we were studying something about this very thing, okay? And I was kind of alluding to all the other things that are in movies that they really shouldn't be watching, okay? And I was making a joke about it, and then I stopped and I said, I know you're doing it anyway. And you know what happened? They got real quiet. Like, busted, okay? <laughs> um, it is not good to subject ourselves to ungodliness. We are going to be subjected to this in our lives. Just drive down the highway, okay? I mean, geez, it's like, this is the world that we're living in. Um, but to subject ourselves continually um, to ungodly things, and especially when the Lord's name is misused so frivolously, what it does is it, it, it wears on us. And, you know, even though we know it's wrong, we, we, we get desensitized to it. And we're just like, well, that's just the way they are. Um, instead of being like, wow, that is really, really bad. And someday they're going to stand before the Almighty, and they're going to have to account for that. And there's no way they're going to be able to do that on their own. And that should not be on my lips, and should definitely not be in my heart. Which is why... You know, again, we have to be very careful about what we're watching. And I, that's hard then because it's really difficult to find good things to watch. Um, I just, you know, we used to 
well, you know, we don't even watch cable anymore. I mean, it's just, it's hard. What is on there that you can even watch nowadays? And make no mistake, all this stuff is very specific. All these scripts are written, all these songs, they know exactly what they're writing. Um, so I would encourage you, you know, to be careful with what you watch. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, you, 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 know you, you can't watch anything. We don't want to be puritanical about it. Um, but we have to really be reasonable. Um, and so we want to guard our ears and our eyes. You know, and that doesn't just go for the young. That goes for everybody. Um, hold on. I will say, uh, you can actually, if you're interested, there is this radio station called Lutheran Public Radio over the Internet. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, it is really, really great because it's all classic hymns and classical Bach music and all this stuff, and it's free. It's and it's done really, really well. It is kind of a sister thing that goes on with issues, etc. cetera. Um, so if you're, if you're wanting to listen to something else besides like Lady Gaga or whatever is the new thing, um, you know, that's available to you. That was not available a, a while back. Um, so, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to have some options, but they're getting fewer. And here's what I will say, and I'll end with this. Spend more time with people. But, but don't spend time just watching something. Actually spend time talking with people. Meditate on the Word of God. Do something wholesome. Um, play games. Go for a walk. Um, take up an interest. And I'll, I'll, I will say this especially. How many of you are, have kids who are leaving the house, about to be empty nesters, or you're empty nesters recently? Okay, it is very, very important for you to be doing this together. Because you, you have all these kids, right? You know, And your life is like super, super busy. And then they start to leave. And you're kind of entering a new time of life. But you have spent all this time of life focusing on your kids. And when they are gone, you know, sometimes they'll come home. Maybe they'll call, right? <laughs> Maybe not as much as we would like. Um, but but it, is a t it is a real opportunity then to actually live for one another and to have common, wholesome interests again um, as husbands and wives. And hopefully you're doing this with your children. And, and growing together in Christ instead of just growing into the culture. Because our culture is just not a godly one. Um, so I think that's something we really need to keep in mind as God's people. And all of this does have to do with keeping God's name holy. That we would not only speak of God day and night, with one another, but that we would live in accordance with it. And I think this is something that we in the church have, have lost sight of because we're trying to keep up with the way that the world is living around us. And we have to live differently to a certain extent because we are different. We are different. And that's not bad. That's a good thing. And I want to apologize because this is so much law. It, it is. That's the one thing about teaching the Ten Commandments week after week that's really hard because it is a lot of law. Um, but Christ is with us, and he forgives us day in and day out, and he has blessed us with one another. And he has blessed us with his word so that we can hear it from each other and always be reminded of it and that we might live lives in accordance with it. We do not have to be slaves to the madness all around us. And in fact, we're not. Christ has set us free by forgiving us so that we can confess without fear uh, and so that we are not ruled by our sins, so that we can live and enjoy the creation as his people because that's actually what he has intended. I don't know if that answers your question. But, but that's, it's, it's a real thing. Okay, we are out of time. 
Um, so uh, next week we'll come and we'll look at the third commandment. We'll go through that one a little bit faster because it's very close in a way with all the stuff I've been talking about with the second commandment. So uh, let us bow our heads uh, and close with prayer. <coughs> Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your holy word, you have divinely revealed yourself uh, to us, both um, uh, your nature as God who is just and holy and righteous, and yet merciful and loving. You have acted in time on behalf of us, your people, uh, by revealing yourself to us and preserving your church. We confess, Lord, uh, that we have not in our daily lives kept your name holy. We have not lived uh, in accordance uh, as your people should, according to your good and gracious will. Lord, we know that you have sent uh, Christ who has continually prayed, who has always spoken the truth both to those who loved him and to those who did not. We give you thanks that he has kept this law for us, that on the last day we who are your people will not be judged according to our misdeeds, but rather we will appear as we do right now in the righteousness of Christ. May you, Lord, keep our hearts and our minds pure, that we might always speak rightfully uh, of you in our daily lives. Make us bold to confess the truth uh, in our church, uh, both here at Faith and in our church body, the Missouri Synod, that we might seek to have unity in the only place where unity exists, and that is in confessing Christ uh, and in confessing uh, the Word of God as it explains itself. Uh, Lord, move all those uh, who do not confess you rightly uh, to repent of their sins, and move us to do so as well when we do, that we might uh, be gathered together uh, around your altar as repentant sinners who come to you uh, to receive the forgiveness of all our sins. Be with husbands and wives and children, be with grandparents, uh, and all your people in our daily lives as we interact with one another and those outside of the church. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat>